All right, let's uh, glance at a couple of things real quickly. And this is, once again, a chart that you're familiar with by now, but there's the overview of Revelation. And then the next one is the overview of chapters 4 through 11 and how it breaks down. I, I try to make it simple for myself because it can be confusing. Uh, confusing. So what we have is the, the action begins in chapter 6 with the opening of the seven seals. And that's the scroll that was given to our Lord. Seven seals it was closed by, and he opened the seven seals, one seal at a time. And then we have uh, chapter 7 is a, par a parenthetical statement, a parenthesis, which is before the seventh seal is open, here's what we're going to see. And this pictures the 144,000. He names 12 tribes of Israel. He doesn't name them in what we think of is the sequential order or in really the order that we know from Old Testament history. But we, but we know that he has the 12 tribes listed. He, for example, he leaves out Dan. He leaves out Ephraim. Those are not there. As well as uh, he puts in the tribe of Joseph, was technically not a tribe itself, but was divided into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. So that's kind of interesting how he does that. So it does show us that it's symbolic in character. But these are the ones that are sealed with a seal on the forehead, which is a protective custody sign that God gave them that they would not be destroyed or, or uh, that they would be killed by what was taking place. Not necessarily that they would escape death, but that they would be sealed as God's people. And so we have 144,000 that are mentioned in the text as coming of the 12 tribes of Israel. However, there is more in verses 9 and 10, you recall, that there were a large number, which no man can number, out of every tribe, nation, tongue, and peoples, that were also sealed. So it's not simply the Jews, that is, Jewish people, Jewish Christians, that were sealed as God's people, but there are many Christians that were non-Jews that were also sealed in protective custody. So that's the idea that we have in Revelation chapter 7. All right, any question on that thus far? Because I want to stop and give you time if you have something to say or question or objection, however you want to say it, um, that's fine with me. All right, let's talk about, if not, let's talk about a couple of things uh, that are errors in this particular text, in this particular chapter. And the first of them, I want to look at the word great tribulation. That's in Revelation 7, what is it, verse 14? <clears throat> So we have in this text, as well as in two other texts in the Bible, the words great tribulation. So we're told, and this is when John asked the question, who are these? Speaking about the great multitude, verse 9. Who are these? He said, these are they that came out of the great, or coming out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes, they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So that gives you a signal. They're Christian people, but these are they that come out of the Great Tribulation. It's interesting to know <clears throat> that we have three passages in the Bible that mention the Great Tribulation. One of them is Daniel 12 and 1, in which Daniel speaks about the days of Antiochus, who was a Greek king three centuries B.C., and he mentions a tribulation at that period. That language... I take it that our Lord is borrowing in Matthew 24, and John is borrowing here to refer to another cataclysm, the destruction of the Jews by Rome and Jerusalem. And so we have that language used. For example, the only two passages in the New Testament where these, that, those words are found is Matthew 24 and verse 21. So you might glance at that very quickly. Matthew 24 and verse 21. Now recall the two questions, Matthew divides it into three, by which this chapter is to be understood. When shall these things be? One stone not left upon another. What shall be the sign when these things come to pass? Matthew adds the end of the age. Apparently the apostles thought that would be the end of the age. And that would, of course, refer to the Jewish age because we have that information in the New Testament. This is the end of the ages, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. The end of these times, Hebrews 1 and 1, so forth. So in that context, remember he tells us in verse 34 of Matthew 24, this generation shall not pass away till all of these things are accomplished. So that tells you 
the time frame, you're to understand these signs. And one of the signs is, verse 20, Pray that your flight be not in winter, nor on the Sabbath, for then shall be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days have been shortened, no flesh should have been saved. Then shall be great tribulation. What's he referring to? The destruction of Jerusalem and the horrors that would accompany it. So that language now is used right here in Revelation 7 and 14. So in the margin of your Bible, you might put the great tribulation, see Matthew, or you might just say, see Matthew 24, 21. The only two passages where this occurs. So that gives us a signal about what Revelation 7 is about. Not only so, but you have the entire chapter sealing Jewish Christians' protective custody by God, that they're his people, that shows you plainly that he's referring to the cataclysm that would come upon Judaism. So there we have the Great Tribulation. So now let's turn attention to, unless there's something you want to mention regarding it, let's turn attention to the 144,000. So that would be, of course, the number that is given here, and that would be uh, the, the tribes of Israel, 12 tribes. Remember, we've already mentioned about how the tribes are not set up exactly as we would expect them to be set up, showing us it's a figurative passage. But we have that, those 12 tribes, and, there's, and then we have it, 144,000, the, mul the, the multiplicity of it. So let's, I want you to notice, here's what the premillennial school tells us about it. And this is one of those sugar stick passages that they love to talk about. So let's spend a few moments. So <clears throat> this is from John Walvoord. John Walvoord was at Dallas Theological Seminary, has impacted heavily the religious world with his premillennial ideas. He has a book called The Millennial Kingdom. And he makes, a, he makes this comment. He said, the one extreme is to disregard prophecy or to interpret it in a non-literal sense. All right, what is he saying here? The study of these demonstrates that when prophecy is fulfilled, it is fulfilled literally. All right. What's he, what's he driving at? What do you think he's setting you up for here? Well, if it's going to be fulfilled literally, we have 144,000. That's it. There's no more. It's not a figurative number. It's not a symbolic number. It's literal. 144,000. End of story. And he said, that's got to be fulfilled literally. But what about the principle that all these prophecies must be understood literally? What about that principle? Isn't that bizarre? Are we to understand that all as we read through Revelation and understand all these things literally? Obviously not. That harks us back to chapter 1, 1 through 3, where he tells us these are in signs, symbols. These are signified by his angel and the spirit, by the Spirit unto John. And these things are shortly to come to pass. So he tells us at chapter 1, 1 through 3, these are in signs and symbols. Why would we say, well, no, it's got to be understood literally. He tells us right at the very first of the book. He does that at the very end of the book also. You might take a, a page turner over here to Revelation 22. Where he tells us not only that these are signs and symbols, but he tells us in this one, these things are shortly to come to pass, verse 6. The time is at hand, verse 10. I come quickly, verse 12. All of these things are to be taking place at that time at, with those people. That's the idea that we have. So we have signs and symbols. That's the first thing, and it was to take place in that particular day. Furthermore, let's think about more broadly the, the principle. Sci these things are to be understood literally. Now, I want you to think about Hebrews 1. 1 through 4 for just a moment. This is really a key to understanding prophecies, generally speaking. So look at Hebrews 1. God, having of old time spoken unto the fathers and the prophets, divers portions and in divers manners, has at the end of these days, there's the last times, there we have it, these last days, 
these last days spoken unto us in the Son. All right, we already have the information thrown out there regarding prophecy. So Paul writing Hebrews, looking back over prophecies, how does he say they were written? How does he say they were written? Now, I read from the ASV, and the King James reads probably the same way, divers portions and in divers manners. Your modern translation might read a little bit differently. What does it say? Anybody have a modern translation? Does not read divers? Many times, many, many times in many ways. Many times, many fashions. Many times, many manners. God spoke through the prophets in many times and in different manners. Can we understand or interpret all prophecy in the same manner if they were all written in different manners? No. <laughs> no. That's foolish to assume, assume that. He tells you the key to interpreting prophecies is to recognize that it was not only different times, but different fashions, different manners they were given in. They were given in different manners. They were spoken in different manners. Some are told in figures of speech such as we would have, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 37, we have David as a type of Christ. We're not to understand that literally, are we? That David, my king, will rule over you? Are we expecting literally David to raise from the dead? No. That's Ezekiel 37, 24. That's not literal. The same thing is the case in so many instances in the Old Testament. They are types. They're symbols of something else. We cannot interpret everything literally any more than they were given literally. Now, are some of them to be understood in literal sense? Yes. How are we to make a determination? How are we to determine how a prophecy is to be understood? This is important. There's only one infallible interpreter of the Old Testament. What is it? The New Testament. <laughs> the New Testament. When the New Testament inspired writers say, this is that, that settles the issue, doesn't it? Surely it does. For those who respect the inspiration of the scriptures. So when David quotes Joel's prophecy about the sun being darkened, the moon turning to the blood, the stars of the heaven shall fall, understood literally. That's from Joel 2, 28, understood literally. Well, no. Why? Because David, I mean, Peter says at verse 17 at Acts 2, this is it. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes through that prophecy. So that, that is the interpreter of the Old Testament. The only infallible, no mistakes, is the New Testament. So the, the idea that we have to come to the New Testament or the Old Testament, as they like to do, and say these have to be understood literally, and that's, that's the manner in which we have to read them. No. No, that's a mistake to begin with. So you see how we're already starting off on a, on a wrong foot. So that's a wild word statement. So let me go on with it. Now, it's the same thing, for example, John 13 and 8. What is in uh, Revelation, rather, 13 and 8? What is in Revelation 13 and 8? We have an interesting text right here regarding a particular number. What is it? Say again. Uh, 13 and 18, I'm sorry. 13 and 18, I'm sorry. I, mis I misled you there. Here, what is the number in 13 and 18? Six, six, six. All right. Are we to understand that literally? Well, that's, the way, that's the way popular theology likes to do it. So they've even had movies where, you know, they look at a boy's hair and pull back. Oh, he's got 666 tattooed in his head. <laughs> oh, he, he's the Antichrist. Well, Antichrist doesn't appear in Revelation. That word does not appear there. First John tells us that Antichrists are already in the world. There are many of them. They're not just one. That's the only time we have the word Antichrist used. First John, and he's the one who tells us, and they're in that day, and there are many of them. Number three, we're not to understand these things literally. They're in signs and symbols. And that's how we are to understand the entirety of Revelation. So the idea that we come to it 
with the idea or the concept that it's got to be understood literally. Not so. Now, I want to read this statement. This is kind of a lengthy statement. I thought it was pretty good. This is from Gary North. Gary North uh, died recently. He was a theologian. I think he was, uh, I think he was located in, I don't know if I'm not, his organization was at least in Tyler, Texas. And he has an interesting statement when he, makes, when he makes regarding this one. So, um, by the way, before I go on, many, many premillennialists disagree with Walvert, who was the chief premillennialist, and say that these are not to be understood literally. So, I mean, they're all disagreeing among themselves. But this is Gary North's statement. I think, oh, this is, this is really good. He says, if all the potential buyers of the Beast of Revelation, this is Kenneth Gentry writing in the preface to Gary North's book, and the book is called The Beast of Revelation, were to discover in advance that it is not filled with prophecies about brain-implanted computer chips, tattoos with identification numbers, Cobra helicopters, nuclear war, New Age conspiracies, most of them would not buy it. Customers of most Christian bookstores too often prefer to be excited by the misinformation provided by a string of paperback false prophecies than to be comforted by the knowledge that the so-called Great Tribulation is long behind us, that it was Israel's tribulation, not the church's. They want thrills and chills, not accurate Bible exposition. They want a string of secret insights, not historical knowledge like legions of imaginative children sitting in front of the family radio back in the 1930s and 40s who faithfully bought their Ovaltine, tore off the wrapper, sent it to receive an unofficial Little Orphan Annie secret decoder. Fundamentalist Christians are repeatedly lured by the tempting promise that they can be the first ones on their block to be on the inside. And so they can be the early recipients of the inside dope. That it is just exactly what they've been sold decade after decade after decade. I thought, well, there's a... Pretty hard-hitting statement, but that's basically where theology is. We just we're so, so enwrapped with all these little secrets and mysteries, and uh, we're on the inside track. And we have churches that kind of they they major in this, and we have this, we have the secret over here. And it's just <clears throat> anyway. I thought Gary North's statement was pretty telling. All right, any comments on that? Yes, ma'am. Uh oh. <laughs> You apologizing to Stanley? Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, we were too quiet. No. So <clears throat> here's how. Here's how it, it works. And it's the same thing with the AD 70, Realized Eschatology. We're going to have a debate later this summer on that issue. And, but it's the same thing there. <clears throat> they take passages, they begin with Matthew 24. That's why I had that screen up here. If you didn't hear the question and, and for the recording, uh, she's asking regarding, uh, do they understand that these things are referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, such as Matthew 24, and the book of Revelation? The answer is absolutely not. Which is why I spent seven classes setting that up. That is, is the destruction of Jerusalem and its expansion to Matthew 24. That's why I went to, that's why I did this, pass, this screen right here. That's why I did this. Because if we understand this, Matthew 24, destruction of Jerusalem, taking place at the year 70, then all of these things now line up pretty easily and we can see how it, it works. But that's not what happens. Well, so what happens? Well, <clears throat> here's how they do it. Just like the little Dakota ring the statement we read a moment ago. We come to a passage such as Matthew 24. And we say, um, this is the premillennialist mind. And you can't, you can't talk to someone about the second coming of Christ. And, you'll not, and you're, you're going to run into this. If you talk to anybody in the denominational world about the second coming of Christ, they're going to say, well, how about this? There are uh, false Christ, false prophets, signs to lead wonders. And I've told you beforehand, then lightning comes forth from the east and seen in the west. Then uh, also, he says it this way, uh, the love of many shall wax cold. We have a song about that. The love of many waxes cold. And that means the second coming of Christ is about to be here. And then let's take, let's take this abomination of desolation right here, verse 15. Verse 15. 
Abomination of desolation. That's Daniel the prophet. So let's uh, put that in there. And then we take Antichrist from uh, 1 John chapter 2 and we pick, uh, mix it all up. And what, what do we have? Confusion on the face of the deep. We are, we are not paying attention to contextual markers in Matthew 24. The love of many waxing cold. Have we heard that? Sure. All the time people say, well, look what's happening in the world today. You know what? From the Middle Ages, even early ages on, Christians always thought, this is the worst of times. It's happening now. Martin Luther said, it was, I tell you what, these signs of revelation are about to occur. And there are so many of them that pumped out those ideas. Well, he's about to come because it can't get more wicked than the Roman church that was ruling them. And they said, well, this is it. This is it. Well, nothing happened. And, and that just goes on and on and on. So that's, that's basically how it happens. They take a passage here, a passage there, and take a, a, prime, a, a principle that says, okay, you've got to interpret these things literally. And they ignore the markers in the text, and then they throw it together. And then what do you got? Confusion. And you have everybody saying, well, okay, it's, about, it's all about to happen because we, we see these signs about to happen right now. Matter of fact, verse 7, Jesus says, Matthew 24, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines and earthquakes. And Do we see earthquakes today? Yeah, okay, that does, that does it. Well, we have an earthquake right now. Okay, there's an earthquake the other day out there in California. Okay, well, that does it. Well, that's, how, that's how we do it. And I, I say that kind of sarcastically, but that's, what, that's how it happens. And so we just, we're not paying attention to the markers, putting them in their context. I don't know if that... It helps or not, but any other questions on that? Any other thoughts on that? Let's talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses for a moment. This is important also because the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are um, very, very assertive in their, in their evangelistic tactics. They knock on your door. And what do they want to talk about? The 144,000. <laughs> they want to talk about the 144,000. Are you a part of the 144,000? The 144,000 are the only ones going to heaven. That's the number exactly, just like John Walbert says. No more, no less. Are you part of it? Well, okay, well, let's look at Revelation 7. So we kind of, and that's how they begin. That's, that's what they talk about. And Armageddon's about to happen. So you better be, you better be sure. <laughs> and that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses begin. So what are some problems with that? Number one, we've already seen the context of it. But let's think about this also. Context, of course, being the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, our Lord tells us Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would sit down in the kingdom with him, Matthew 11, 8 and 11. But more than that, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which tribe do they belong to of Israel? Let me ask you that question. What tribe do they belong to of Israel? What tribe did Abraham belong to? Anybody know? Huh? Was it Judah? What? There were no tribes? What, what tribe did Isaac belong to? Okay, there's called the tribes of Israel. Who is Israel? Well, we have to go back to Genesis <laughs> and do our whole class on Genesis. Over. <laughs> Who is Israel? What man? Abraham's grandson. Who? Jacob. Okay, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob changed his name to Israel or his name was changed to Israel. So the 12 tribes of Israel are the sons of Jacob, Israel. As Jim pointed out, no such thing as tribes when Abraham was alive. No such thing as tribes of Israel when Isaac was alive. No such thing as tribes when Jacob was alive. So only those of these tribes are going to be in heaven. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are out. They're out, gone. Can't be a part of it. Because there were no tribes. How about you? To what tribe do you belong to? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, here's, let's, let's, let's broaden it just a minute. How many Gentiles are in the 144,000? None, zero. Are you a Gentile? I, I mean, I don't know all of your family trees, but maybe we might have some Jews in here. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, we're all Gentiles. So we're out. We're out. Okay. There's no, there's no part of it if you're a Gentile. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Bessie said she's, she wants to go have a good time. I think, well, <laughs> yeah, I see that, Dave. I see that, Dave. Well, there's no Well, there's a counseling room back here afterwards. We'll just, <laughs> but that's true. That's right. There would be no hope. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about this? How, what, what tribes are missing? We look at that in Revelation 7. What tribes are missing from the list? Dan and Ephraim. Dan and Ephraim are the two missing. Joseph was not a tribe. Joseph actually was split into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So no one from the tribe of Dan, no one from the tribe of Ephraim can be there either. Because they're not listed. So who are some heroes that come from Dan and Ephraim? Well, I, kind of, I put a list together of several of them here. How about Joshua? He's from the tribe of Ephraim. How about Samson? He's from the tribe of Dan. No mention of that at all. There are others too as well. So Joshua's out. If only the 144,000 from those particular tribes can be admitted. You see, the whole thing becomes a lesson in absurdity with the Jehovah's Witnesses and even with the premillennialists regarding the 144,000. It's a symbolic number of completeness of those Jews who are going to be protected by God through the persecution, the great tribulation at that time, at the destruction of Jerusalem, and then also the wars that would take place, inclusive of all from every tribe, language, tongue, and nation, verse 9. And that's the idea. Chapter 7. Okay, that's a summary of it real quickly. Anything that you want to mention pertaining there too? Say again. Yeah. So are those the only ones going to heaven? See, that's the idea. And it's not even talking about, you know, okay, these are the people in all, all time, all ages, going to go to heaven. We're not even... We're not even beginning to understand the hem of the garment of the book if we say, okay, this is one that's going to go to heaven, and that's it. <laughs> well, that may be true. There are more than, she said there are more than 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know. I don't know how they would. That's a good point, actually. I don't know what, how they handle that one. All right, let's, let's look at... The final opening of the seal, which is chapter 7, or beginning chapter 8, actually. And uh, let's, I want to do an overview, because this is, uh, this is, at least in my mind, it's important to see uh, an overview and how it's, how it's laid out, what we have here. So we have verse 1, the seventh seal is open. Remember, there's the book, the closed book, now the seventh seal is open. So he sees an angel, another angel, verse 3. We're just going to run down to it. And so we have the seventh seal divided into, subdivided into, what was it? We had it on the chart here. Right here. The seventh seal is divide, subdivided into seven trumpets. All right, why subdivided into seven trumpets? It's, it's dramatic effect. It's just like in a movie that you're putting off the conclusion, this, the finale, and you're, and you're building suspense, you're building intensity in the story. That's all that we have here understood symbolically. And so he takes the seventh seal and says, okay, it's not like, oh, yes, done. Now he subdivides that into seven trumpets. So let's look at the trumpets. The first one is found in verse 7. 
Chapter 8, verse 7, and that is, the earth is smitten. Do you see that? Then we have the second one is found in verse 8. What is smitten here? Great mountain cast into the sea, and it's the sea. A third part of the ships were destroyed. That's the sea is smitten. The third one is verse 10. Third angel sounded. What, is, what does he see? A star burning. And what, what happens? What does the star do? Say again. Fell from the sky. What, what does he destroy? What does it destroy? The water. The water systems, right. The water, the fountains of the waters. The rivers and fountains. So let's go to verse 12. The fourth one sounded. And what's smitten here? What is what's hit, huh? The sun. The sun is smitten. All right. Then we have, finally, come down here to uh, chapter 9 and verse 1. And you have a fifth angel sounds. And what do you have? A star fallen, from, uh, fallen to the earth from heaven. There was given to him a key of the pit of the abyss. He opened the pit of the abyss and went up smoke out of the pit. And then we have verse 3, which came out of the pit is locust. Well, where did that language come from? Well, that's all language right out of Joel's prophecy, chapter 2. Joel has all of these, uh, the wars and the warriors pictured as locusts, and he gives, us, he gives us graphic description of these warriors that are like locusts. So it's a locust plague. Then we have, go down to verse 13, we're just doing a bird's eye view. The sixth angel sounds, and then what do you have? You have armies from the Euphrates, the angels holding back the winds, remember that, how it's opened in chapter 7? Now you have armies coming over the Euphrates, and in other words, they're let loose. That, that is what God has been holding back is let loose. And here they come. Euphrates being a symbolic river, not necessarily to be understood literally. That was how it was always understood in the Old Testament from the Euphrates. And then finally, let's go to chapter 11 and verse 15. And you will see the seventh angel that sounds and there's followed voices in heaven. And this is, of course, the kingdom of the world. That is, the rulership of the world is turned over to the rulership of Christ. And that's what we have in 11.15. So those, those are the seven angels that sound. So you see how the seventh seal is now subdivided into seven different sounds. So that kind of breaks it up and gives us, uh, gives us an anticipation and what's about to occur. Let's notice also this. Um, let's just let's pick up. Uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 7, and look at four things that are presented. There's an interlude here, t 10 and 1. So you might, if you mark in your Bibles, from chapter 10, verse 1, through uh, chapter, uh, let's say it's 10, I guess it's 10, 1 through 7, the first is an interlude here, or pause, I guess, I guess actually the, the major interlude is chapter 10 all the way through chapter 11, verse uh, Verse 14. There's kind of a pause in the action. And there's messages that are given. And then this pause in the action, there are four things that occur. Let's watch what happens. And we'll go back and pick up the pieces as we go along. Number one is verse 1 of chapter 10. A mighty angel coming down from heaven, arrayed with a cloud and a rainbow on his head. So there he has number one. And he says, basically, the message is that delay will be no longer. See that in verse 6? No more delay. All of this has been delayed. What's happening, with the actions happening to Jerusalem, it's all been delayed. Then you have, there's an eating of a little book. This will be chapter 10 and verse 9, you, where you have eating up the book. This is John being spoken to, makes his belly bitter. In your mouth it will be sweet as honey. So he ate the little book. And then he said, verse 11, you'll prophesy again over many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That would be to, to John. So that's number two thing. Number three thing, the thing, third thing that happens in this interlude is a measuring of the temple of God, chapter 11, beginning verse 1. There was given to me a reed like a rod. And one said, rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. So we have the measuring of the temple of God. And then number four we have the two witnesses, verses 3 through 13. Two witnesses who testified of our Lord, and then they were killed. So those are the four things that happened. So we have seven trumpets, 
After the sixth trumpet, there's an interlude, there's an intermission, pause in the action, so that we can bring the crescendo finally, and the seventh angel finally sounds, chapter 11, verses, verse 15. So that's how it's laid out. Does that make sense? Now, in my mind, I, I like, I need an overview. I need, I need to see the big picture before I can descend into the details. You may be that way too. Sometimes people uh, begin in the details and then kind of find the big picture later. That, that's fine if you do it that way, but I, I like to find the big picture. So that's what's happened. So here's how it breaks down. Seven seal, seven trumpets. The climax is the temple in chapter 11. Something else interesting here, and that is, Measure the temple of God, and he tells us in verse 8 that the temple is found in what city? Chapter 11. What, what city is the temple found in? What is the city, though, that is called Sodom and Egypt? The city where... Where our Lord was crucified. Where was he crucified? Jerusalem. Here is the city that is where our Lord was crucified. That's where the temple is. Which is called Sodom and Egypt. Well, why was it called Sodom and Egypt? Well, because of the wickedness. That's, those are symbolic names. But he tells us very plainly. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so we have specifically told right here, chapter 11, verse 8. That's the city where our Lord was crucified, and he's talking about the temple, measuring it. It seems to me pretty clear that he's talking about the city of Jerusalem, very plainly says so in verse 8, and what takes place there. All right, any questions on that? Anything that we, uh, we hurried over some of that material? We're going to go back and pick some of the pieces up. Anything you want to ask about it? Or discuss. All right. That's all right. If you do, that's okay. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's uh, pick up uh, chapter uh, 8. And we'll talk about uh, verses 1 and following here. <clears throat> so we have, he opened the seventh seal. They're followed in silence in heaven, a space of a half hour. I saw seven angels that stand before God. There were given to them seven trumpets. So here we have the preface to the seven trumpets blasting. Another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should add it unto the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. All right, literal? No. No, he tells us real plainly this is the prayers of the saints, the golden censer, the prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. The angel takes the censer and he filled it with fire of the altar, cast it upon the earth, and there followed thunders, voices, lightnings, and earthquakes. So that would be a press blast, the trumpets. Seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared to sound, and the first sounded, blasted the trumpet. There followed hail, fire, mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth, and the third of the earth was burnt up. The third of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. I don't know that there's special significance to one-third, but simply to ID, the idea is partial. It was a partial, partially being destroyed, and that's what we have here. It's just not completed. The picture's not yet completed. It's partial. Now, you might keep your finger here. Let's go to Luke chapter 21 for just a moment. Luke 21, and the verses are 25 and 26. You recognize Luke 21 as one of the passages that are destruction of Jerusalem passages. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. What does Luke 21 say in verse 25? Now, we have already... Told, he says, verse 20, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know that a desolation is at hand. Pretty plain there. These are the days of vengeance. Verse 22, all things that are written may be fulfilled. Verse 24, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, led captive unto all the nations. 
Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then finally we have this. There shall be signs in sun, moon, and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, in perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the billows. Poetic language. Men fainting for fear and for expectation of things which are coming on the world or on this age. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Literal? No, I take it to be symbolic. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads. You know that your redemption, that is, your release, your release is drawing nigh. Verse 20, 31 says, when you th see these things coming to pass, know the kingdom of God is nigh. That is, God in his power is operating. Very Verse 21, right before he finishes up, that's exactly what he says. He says, And they repented not of their murders, their sorceries, their fornication, or their thefts, which is, I'm glad you brought it up because that's the practical point of it. These destructive forces were to cause them to repent, and they repented not. That's exact, I think that's exactly right. Say again. No, we're in Revelation. I'm sorry, this is Revelation. I, I referred back to Luke 21 a moment ago, verses 25 and 26. But I think you were reading a, a note in Revelation there, weren't you, that you had yeah, written? I, just, I made a note, and it was in uh, right after uh, chapter or 5, Revelation 5. I just made a note. Oh, right. And we were probably doing the same thing years ago, flipping back. And, anyway, I just made a, a note. Right. That, and that's exactly what the Jews had an opportunity to, and it shows us God's principle that that's exactly right. When we see things happening like that, wrath, whether it be then or today, we have opportunities to repent. And I think that's, a, that's the good practical message of it. That's right. I believe that, and I think that's what we have in chapter 9, the end of chapter 9. They didn't repent. So, completely destroyed. Sad, isn't it? Will America repent? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm fearful myself. I know. <laughs> well, I'm not either. I think it has to get a lot worse before people realize what, we, what we've done. But, okay, thank you for that comment, and we'll conclude with that one.